All right, congratulations. You have found the debut episode for this year of Iconic Sonics, brought to you by our new and, and, and favorite sponsor, well, one of our favorite sponsors, the Swinomish Casino and Lodge outside beautiful Anacortes, Washington. We welcome them uh, to the show as a presenting sponsor this year, and we're thrilled to have them on board. And we welcome back our friends from Dick's Drive-In Restaurants, uh, 65 years, 66 maybe now, uh, serving Seattle. And I, I'm looking at, at a couple of guys, our guests for our first episode of Iconic Sonics. And I'm, I'm going to go, since we have a casino now, the Swinomish Casino, I'm going to place a bet that each of you have enjoyed a Dick's Deluxe at some point in your long history in Seattle. We welcome in uh, one of our, our city's favorite basketball sons, Spencer Hawes, a great career in the NBA, following a great career at the University of Washington, a high school career in Seattle, uh, and Chris Daniels from King 5, who has covered the Sonic story uh, for the entire time since they left in 08 until now, as, as we start to see maybe peeking over the horizon, the team coming back. Guys, would I be right? Spencer, I'll start with you. I'm going to assume you've had a Dick's Deluxe at some point in, in your life. Before or after every Sonics game, that's for sure. Uh, no, it's <laughs> it's been uh, probably four days since my last deluxe. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Chris, can you beat that? Has it been three for you? It hasn't been three, but I can confirm I have had a Dick's deluxe. Yeah, well, we we thank Dick's and the Swedish Casino for being a part of it. And guys, I I love having you on the uh, the debut episode, and I thought it would be good. You know, I I think I saw both of you uh, at the Lenny Wilkins. A street renaming ceremony. I want to get to that in a minute. But first, and Chris, I don't know if you had any occasion to cross paths with Frank Furtado. I'm going to assume no, because you don't need your ankles taped to do what you do on King 5. Spencer, you never played for a team that was trained by Frank, but you grew up in Seattle. If you grew up in the basketball community in this town, you knew Frank Furtado. Frank passed away right before we recorded this episode. We wanted to dedicate this episode to him. Spencer, you know better than others, the trainer, a good trainer, is the quiet behind the scenes hero of any successful NBA team. And Frank was that for, for well over a quarter of a century, longer than that here in Seattle. Well, I think if you, if you look just back at the iconic names uh, of which there've been many uh, in the franchise history, you know, he's up there with, you know, his name's up there in the rafters with guys that are, uh, you know, champions, hall of famers and, and what have you. So his, his impact on the franchise and the community uh, over all the decades he was here was astounding. And we were talking about it, all, you know, before, uh, before the show got started, it, when, uh, when they do come back, whenever that is, we're not going to put a timeline on it, but, uh, you know, it'd be cool if, uh, the Furtado center came back around into existence for a second time. I think that'd be great, Chris. He'd be the first guy I could think of to have the same building named after him twice because they named the practice facility after Frank, the Frank Furtado Center. It's going to be this great thing. And then all of a sudden, poof, the team goes away. The practice center goes away. Uh, and and now, again, I, I I think they're on the horizon of coming back. I don't think it's going to be next year, but it, we're getting closer. It, it would be cool, wouldn't it, to see him? Uh, you know, he's gone now, but what an honor for his family to have the building named after him twice. Well, yeah, and and he had his his name in a prominent part of town, right? And we're going to talk right. about this. Just uh, you know, the Furtado Center, right by uh, the old arena, by the old Coliseum, that was where the Sonics had a lot of their events, and and it's it's gone now. And um, it, it would be nice that his name could can continue here, wherever that next practice facility is. Guys, I'll talk to both of you about the Lenny Wilkins thing because Lenny certainly knew Frank, and, and and Lenny's a part of basketball history in this town. Uh, 84 and looks great. And the city of Seattle, and I think they worked with the Kraken. Uh, they did a nice thing. They named the street Spencer in front of the arena after Lenny. No, no, no better guy to, to choose to do that, in my opinion. Talk a little bit about the event that day because it was unbelievable. I shouldn't say unbelievable. It was very cool to see the basketball community come together for him. And the idea that anything in this town has faded, Spencer, in terms of basketball would be put aside if for anybody who could have been there that day or anybody who was there. And there was a huge crowd of former basketball stars who came out and said, no, I'm, I'm a part of this. I played basketball in Seattle. I know who Lenny Wilkins is and I want to be a part of this renaming ceremony. Yeah. I mean, I think Lenny's name is, is as well respected uh, across the NBA circles, across the basketball circles, anywhere. Uh, you know, he, his contribution contributions as a player and then as a coach and everything that he's done, 
you know, going back to the 60s, 70s, and especially in this town with what that championship, you know, I wasn't around uh, myself for that championship, but you hear people tell stories about what that meant to the community and the city as a whole and kind of comparing and contrasting it to the Seahawks when they had their run. And by most accounts, uh, it doesn't sound like there, you know, there was much, much comparison between the two championships. One, not to discount what the Seahawks did at all, but one kind of astoundingly seems like it, it holds a, a different place in people's hearts that were around for it back in 79. And so for him to get that type of credit and just, send a message to the basketball community, both in Seattle and outside of Seattle, that there is such a rich history here and it is a basketball town and in no small part to the contributions of, of coach Wilkins. I think it's, it was really fun to see how it tied everything together. Chris, as, as you've gone along covering these stories, you know, one of the things for me is I, I never thought in 08 when the team left, that it would be this long and we'd still be talking about them coming back. I thought they'd be back by now. I thought it'd be more like a Cleveland Browns situation where they were gone for a couple of years and they got it done. Setting that aside for a minute, you know, in our business, we, you know, we see things can come and go and it, it seems like even faster and faster now in our, in our social media world, stuff just disappears. It's something as a, as a reporter to stand there and look around and go, wow, you know, this thing was publicized, but it wasn't overly publicized and 500, 600 people show up including, I say, probably 50 or, or, or 75 basketball legends. It's rare to see a story and, 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 and something as unique as the Sonics still maintain a hold on this city all these years later, don't you think? Yeah, and, and as far as Lenny's you know, place in, in Seattle lore, uh, you know, I, your friends at KJR did a, did a bracket uh, during the, the height of the pandemic on the top Seattle sports moments and top Seattle sports figures, and I – I had in my final Sue Bird and, and Lenny Wilkins, just in terms of their success, their place in, in Seattle sports history. And, and I gave Lenny the edge over Sue because of what he has done in this community. And, and that event uh, that you're mentioning in particular with the, the, the ceremony inside the armory before uh, the street uh, was officially renamed after, after Lenny Wilkins. I think you saw it in that room. It wasn't just basketball royalty and Sonics royalty, but it, it, it was significant members of this community uh, because of his work with the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic. I mean, he is he's known for more than just the Sonics and the fact that he stayed here uh, with the record being a three time Hall of Famer. I, I, he he has legendary status. And I I have seen through the years going to his foundation events in Bellevue just the pull that Lenny has and, and the weight that Lenny has still in, in NBA circles. I think it helps Seattle's case uh, ultimately uh, when we're talking about the Sonics, but you look at the, the, the players that have come out, the retired players, the, the Charles Barkley, Magic Johnson, Clyde Drexler one year. I mean, it speaks to the, the recognition and, and the, the significance of Lenny Wilkins, not only, in Seattle sports history, but in basketball in particular. And, and Spencer, I'll ask you to read the NBA tea leaves a little bit. You spent a lot of time in the league, and I know you're still actively involved with talking with people, and, and you're at the at the front of, of the line of people saying, let's get the Sonics back. You know, I, I'll detour a second. I was looking at your great NBA career, and I know you're probably aware of this, and it almost breaks my heart to say this. You played one game in Seattle. You played hundreds and hundreds of games over 12 years with all kinds of teams and in the playoffs and in playoff hunt and all that, uh, it, it, it's, it, you're a Seattle guy. You, your family's a Seattle family. It, it's got to tug at you a little bit that only once did you, did you get to show your skills in front of your hometown as a pro? Yeah. The first one I was scheduled my rookie year, I twisted my ankle the day before in practice. <laughs> so that, that shut that down. And then, uh, <clears throat> then we, we only had the one more game that year up at key arena, but it, I mean, I would still put that for a meaningless uh, regular season game between two franchises that weren't going anywhere in a hurry. Uh, you know, where that ranks for me individually in terms of my favorite games that I've ever played is definitely at the top of the list. And, you know, walking into the, the arena now, obviously it looks a lot different than when I would go down there with my dad as a kid to go to Sonics games, but you still kind of get that feeling that you're back in. And even though, most is most of it has changed. There's still, you know, the iconic roof line and everything else. And, you know, you're still on the footprint of where so much great basketball history took place in the city. And for so many of us uh, that were lucky enough to grow up and, and go on to play uh, in college and professionally where 
a big part of that love of the game was born uh, in that arena and watching our, our heroes growing up. And, and didn't some of that come from George Carl in the 90s for you guys, for the guys of your age? You know, George did a great job of connecting the Sonics. And, and I wasn't here when Lenny was the coach. I'm sure he was doing the same thing. But of connecting the Sonics to the local high school and even younger community, sponsored an AAU team. He was always you know, stirring the local basketball pot a little bit. And that obviously is important. To, uh, I, I would assume you can speak to it better than I can. Well, with George and, and his founding of Friends of Hoop, uh, for all of us that were fortunate enough to play for Coach Marsh and to be impacted by that program, um, that, you know, that's an influence that he had that starting close to 20 some years ago uh, is still benefiting kids to this day. And, and, you know, you can go down the list of all the guys, uh, you know, from e- even well before my time down to kids that are in high school now, they're playing uh, for one of the Friends of Hoop teams at, at various levels. Um, he he did a great job embracing that aspect of the community and cultivating uh, not only the talent that he had on the Sonics roster, but also, uh, you know, that next younger generation of a lot of guys that had some connection to the franchise, whether it be, you know, family members, friends, whatever it was, um, making sure that, that we had a program that, you know, that we could get involved with that would give us the best opportunities to be successful. I'll ask both of you this next question. And Spencer, I'll start with you. And then Chris, you can chime in. I, I know from, from talking to, to people who are in the basketball community here that part of what's happened over the last couple of years, now that a building is done, Again, you can talk a little more tangibly about the NBA possibly coming back. But for those of us who want to see the team come back, beating up the NBA at this point isn't helping. You know, the, the, the point is, hey, let's let's we've got what you needed now. Let's let's get the team back. That all being said, read the tea leaves a little bit for me, guys. I don't think Adam Silver cuts the little promo that he did for Lenny Wilkins getting the arena named after him. If in his mind, there isn't some progress towards getting the team back here, Spencer, I, I think I, I read that as a signal that we're all reading the tea leaves correctly. This this was the first big step. Get the building. Now you got to find ownership. I think there are people who want to own the team. Adam Silver, I don't know if he does this five or six years ago. I'm not sure if the league was in position. What, what did you did, Am I reading too much into that or is that accurate? No, I mean, I think that obviously the economic situation has shifted so dramatically, even in the last five years in terms of the media rights and new forms of revenue, be it gambling, which is they're still trying to figure out how they're uh, fully going to implement the data and everything that they have that's extremely valuable for that whole um, that no- whole new potential source of revenue or the international international rights to the game, streaming, what have you. Uh, it's so from a business side, it's in a position to be able to absorb two more teams and continue growing the pie at a place that makes sense for the established owners. And then from a talent standpoint, you know, that's always been the traditional argument against expansion is it'll dilute the talent. I think there's so much talent across the board, obviously internationally contributing to the game as a whole and young up and coming talent that that argument to me is, is kind of going by the wayside. And the other factor that I think that you have to consider is, you know, unfortunately a lot of the characters that were involved with the team moving in the first place, uh, you know, are either so far distanced from the NBA uh, in terms of he who shall not be named that we don't need to uh, talk about Mr. Starbucks again, or uh, commissioner Stern who's passed away that, uh, there's kind of a natural progression of, of turning over a new leaf and coming back to a city and a market that is as plug and play of an expansion uh, franchise you'd like to think as the league's ever had in terms of the opportunity that presents itself in 2021 forward uh, in Seattle. Chris? Yeah, I, w- I would uh, I would tell you this, Gas, that th- there is a playbook uh, for all of this. We saw the playbook back in in 2008 and the couple of years leading up to the Sonics departure we saw a playbook being rolled out in 2013 with the Kings and, and how David Stern, the late David Stern kind of wiggled back and forth with that. And we the playbook with Gary Bettman and the NHL as a guide here for what Adam Silver 
is doing. If you think back uh, to 2017, I mean, we can even go further than that with the NHL, but in 2017, I have an email from the NHL saying there's nothing to talk about in Seattle. And by the end of 2018, we have an expansion franchise and, and Bettman had gone from, there's no chance we're ever going to expand to, we're going to accept applications. We're going to take in those applications. We're waiting on Seattle. Seattle didn't give us one. So we're going to open it up again. And, and by making all those announcements, uh, he, he is, not only signaling externally that they're open for business, but he's trying to build a coalition internally so he can have a majority vote. And so we went from no way, no how in 2017 to having an expansion franchise in 2018. So how does that work with the NBA? We're seeing it now with Adam Silver when it was just about a year ago, right before Christmas, when he opened the door and said they've dusted off their expansion uh, plans and playbook. Then uh, it was Jenny Durkin, the mayor of Seattle, in January, who told me that she had then talked to Silver and was optimistic about uh, a franchise coming to Seattle. As you know, that just started everything up again, and it was a, a national story. It was on the ESPN ticker that the, the mayor of Seattle was saying she was optimistic about a Sonic's return. And, and then Silver made a couple of other comments about Seattle being at the top of the list. I believe that what he is doing is not only signaling that, that they're open for business, but that uh, he is trying to build a coalition internally. He doesn't have it to go forward with expansion right now. But I, I think this is part of the process. And it wouldn't surprise me here within the next few months if Silver makes another comment, if he gets questioned about this again, that the door cracks open even more. Uh, I, I think we're, we're a lot closer than we have been in the past. But I think what you're seeing right now, and yes, to come back to that video, uh, I, I think that is is one of the crumbs, one of the breadcrumbs he's he's right. doing to, to build up uh, that coalition, both externally and internally. To add to your point, Chris, the uh, the sort of state of the union for the NBA occurs every year at the All Star break, and I think you know not to not to put the cart too far out ahead of the horse, but I could see that as is an opportunity. Um, I don't know if it, it'll come directly from him or if they'll plan it with uh, with one of you guys in the media or how it's gonna gonna happen. But I, I would think that would be an opportunity uh, to come out and, and maybe drop a little, another little crumb and, and kind of keep the ball rolling with that process um, on what is generally his biggest stage of the year outside of the draft, where he has the opportunity to you know convey his message the way he wants to. You know, I'll ask an obvious question because I think we're all, again, speaking of breadcrumbs, we've probably all heard a little of, of, of you know, little crumbs of news. Uh, Spencer, I don't think ownership will be a problem. I don't know if there's four or five groups fighting over it, but I think, and you brought up a great point, you're good in, in any sport, you'd be hard pressed to find a better plug and play, to use your phrase, situation. There's always people who want to be involved in pro sports. There's always people who want to be involved at the ownership level. I don't think that'll be, and I think having OVG as somebody who's interested in filling up more dates in their new building, I, I think business-wise, this all falls together pretty quick once the league makes the determination that they want to move forward. Is that the sense you get? Yeah, I mean, I still think that there's questions that need to be answered about the building. Uh, I know from uh, having experience playing on the Clippers and – being the, the proverbial stepchild uh, in the pecking order of the building that the, the association does not enjoy uh, not having the, uh, you know, kind of first right of refusal as it, as it pertains to the schedule and concerts and everything else. But when you walk through, you know, I was down at a Seattle U game a couple weeks ago uh, and you're walking through the tunnel and you see a locker room that just says NBA locker room, uh, you know, next to the door, you realize that, for all the issues that need to get worked out, the biggest one has always been the building. Uh, and at least according to the NBA stance, whether that's the case or not with what everything that went down in 2008, you've answered in their mind how they've, how they've uh, you know, kind of shifted the argument that the issue is the building. And now you have arguably, uh, I, I think I tweeted something about it a couple of weeks ago. I've been to most arenas in, in North America. I haven't seen one to this point that compares with the climate pledge. Uh, so you cross that box off and the rest of the, the rest of the questions that need to be answered, I think, um, not that it's going to be easy, but those can be solved pretty quickly with the, uh, with the resources in this city and, and everything else that's fallen into place in the last, uh, you know, 18 to 24 months. 
Chris, you've got every billionaire in town on speed dial. Um, <laughs> I, 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 Spencer's point is a good one, and some details still have to be worked out. I think finding someone to own this team or finding a group of people to own it would, would not be difficult in this city. Yeah, I mean, and to build off what Spencer says uh, said, I, I, I have talked to the mayor-elect, uh, Bruce Harrell, who has suggested that he's already been in contact with uh, multiple potential ownership groups and and people that still hold out the idea that they can do that uh, down in Soto, uh, where that land is still uh, together. And that group is still saying, at least publicly, that they're going to hold on to that land until the Sonics come back. But but Bruce Harrell has told me he's been in contact with with multiple ownership groups. And, you know, I, I think that any mayor uh, or, or any elected official and I think back to hearing it from Norm Rice, they you don't want to want to lose a team. And that's why Norm Rice fought so hard to build Key Arena at the time. But, boy, it would be nice to be the mayor that also brings back the Sonics. Uh, mm-hmm. and I think Harrell, uh, he's told me that on the record that that is one of the things he'd like to accomplish during his next term. And it sounds like. Uh, he's already been in contact with people looking at looking to do it. And, and you know, I should preface what I said about Soto in that uh, that Adam Silver video that you mentioned uh, about Lenny Wilkins. He, he talked specifically about the shiny new arena uh, in Seattle. Yeah. So that would that would lead you to believe that uh, that's where the focus is as far as the NBA is concerned. I, I, Spencer, I'd be very surprised if the OVG group, and even if they've got details to work out, they're motivated to get tenants and they're going to be motivated, even though the Kraken right now are driving the bus. They're, they're going to be motivated to cut a deal that works for an NBA team uh, because they don't want to see it. I mean, this 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 almost would be the Seattle thing to do is we haven't had a building for all these years, and now we're going to build two. OVG doesn't want to see a building spring up and, and lose those potential 41 dates, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, they wouldn't be in the position they're in if that's how they were going about doing business. In, right. And- being as they already own a hockey team, they understand the business of monopolies and how those work, which <laughs> professional franchises are at the end of the day. But I think my concern with with that group's involvement would be, you know, if Kraken tickets sold out in 12 minutes or whatever it was when, when they first put those out there, when they announce it for the Sonics, it's going to break the servers. The demand is going to be however many times more than for a hockey team, all due respect to hockey you know, we're embracing it early, but this is a basketball town. This will always be a basketball town. Uh, it's just, it's part of our DNA as a city and it's part of our history. And I could see there being some concern from their end that you build this beautiful arena for your expansion hockey team. Two or three years later, you bring back an expansion basketball team. You know, people can only be interested in so many things at once and right. how much of the demand for their product uh, would then shift back to, the basketball fans in this city and what, how much would that impact their business where there might be some reluctance to have to try and uh, compete with it, which we've seen from the Mariners and we don't have to go into the cluster that is that front office and that franchise over the last 20 years and their efforts to block it, uh, <clears throat> block the arena in Soto, which I don't think get enough attention in terms of the things that the Mariners have screwed up in this city mm-hmm. is how many steps they've gone to, to prevent the NBA from coming back here because they're afraid of competing with the spirit product. And the good news is from that standpoint, again, with a building up in Queen Anne, and again, you talk about history, you know, the people will, will, you know, they'll reflect back on that. The, the Seattle sports fan muscle memory is going to Queen Anne for basketball games. And, and we'll see if that continues. Uh, this is, I can't go ahead. Wanted to jump in too about the idea of a, a, a third tenant there. A lot of people are seeing sticker shock right now with the beer prices at Climate Pledge at uh, at fifteen bucks a pop. But yeah, self included. Yeah, <laughs> think about uh, the amount of concessions and parking, and uh, you know the fact that the city of Seattle is in business with with OVG at this point. Uh, that the city of Seattle benefits if there's uh, extra parking revenue and extra people coming to Seattle Center. So. Uh, that's the sticky wicket for any sort of Soto group. Uh, if if somebody said, hey, I want to build my own arena and it's in Soto, that, that's the way that gets done. Uh, but it, it, the, the path is much smoother at this point uh, to go to uh, Climate Pledge, especially with the financial incentives, not only for Oakview, but for uh, the city of Seattle. Spencer, I've, I've, I've kind of joked with you over the years. I keep calling you a former NBA player. It took you a while to, to come to that decision, right? You're still an incredibly young guy. People think of Spencer Hawes. We've been hearing about him for years. You're still young enough that, that, uh, that you could go play, but I mean, the opportunities, if they're not there, they're not there, right? If, if you 
turned in papers? Are you officially retired or could you get signed? No, there's no reason to do that at this point. Well, uh, oh, you know, boy. <laughs> I'm still having fun. I'm still I'm still playing. And, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But no, it does take time. And, and it's it's not an easy process. I think uh, no matter what level you kind of end your your journey in that sport or passion or whatever it may be for different people. But um, it's it's getting easier and easier. And, and I think, uh, you know, what we've been talking about, I think it it would help my process um, just kind of tying a bow on it. If, you know, the Sonics were to come back and, and whatever level of involvement I could have trying to help that process, I think would be a, a fun way to turn the page, uh, you know, from being a player to, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the journey has in store afterwards. Well, how, how do you see that? Have you thought about it? Now, clearly you have, I mean, is it a front office? Is it a coach? Uh, how, how would you see? And, and again, I know you want to be careful. Nobody's offered you. They're not even a team yet, but, I'm sure you'd be an attractive guy to have involved in this process, given your background, your experience. How do you see that unfolding for you? I mean, I, I haven't gotten too far into it. I just, I want to support uh, the city, the, or, the eventual organization, uh, whatever parties that be uh, in any way that I can uh, just to make sure that we, we get a team back, we secure a team and, and we put them in the best possible position, um, you know, right off the bat to hit the ground running. I've always, the Sonics have been my favorite favorite franchise since uh since i can remember you know rooting for anybody when people ask me who my favorite team is i i always said the sonics despite whatever team i was playing on at the time uh so it, it holds a, a special place in my heart in my family uh you know my uncle was fortunate enough to get a play for the sonics for a couple of years during his career so it's always it's always been special to to myself and my family and i think it it's part of the process of, you know, the game's been very good to me and, and I've been blessed uh, with everything that it's given me. And, and if there's an opportunity to give back, uh, not only to the game, but to this community that, that I've always called home, I think that would be a, a special opportunity. Chris, one thing I always thought, uh, I, I love Squatch, but I thought he was awfully short. What if we bring the world's tallest Sasquatch mascot back when the Sonics return? And nobody says who it is, but we're all like, I think I got an idea who the seven-foot guy in the Sasquatch outfit is. <laughs> Great idea, because, uh, yeah, T. Weedle. We, we can go back to T. Weedle, sure, right? Sure, sure. Go, go in the history books there, yeah. But we got to bring back Squatch at some point. Poor Squatch. What? I think, I, well, again, that gets back to the plug and play discussion we had earlier. There's so much that's already ready for that. Spencer, when the, when the game comes back, it's a different game than what we all saw in 2008. Everybody's got TV and a lot of basketball fans are, you know, maybe they were mad for a year or two, but most people have come back to watching the NBA. I'm, I'm sure it does hit you. And, and even to the point where you played at the end of your NBA playing career to this point with the Milwaukee Bucks and played with a couple of the guys that were the champions this year. You were a part of a transition decade in this league. Big guys coming out to the perimeter and being able to score from the perimeter. And that's kind of that's a little different from how the game was played, say, 20 years ago. Do you think about that? They're like, yeah, you, you, you were one of the you'd flourish in today's NBA in terms of, of you know, if you were just coming out of college right now with your skills. Yeah, selfishly, I think I missed my window by a couple of years, but yeah, uh, it it is in a great position and uh I think even with the adjustments that they made this year, kind of turning back the clock a little bit in terms of getting rid of some of the little ticky tacky calls and, and some of the gray area on, you know, what's a shooting foul, what gives the uh, offensive player much of an advantage. I think this year specifically from a fan standpoint, which is how I watch the game now, I think it's as enjoyable as I can remember uh, just the flow, the, the skill level uh, I think is what stands out. It There's, if, if you're not skilled in today's NBA, not only can you not find yourself on the floor, you're probably not going to be on a roster. So kind of getting back to the point we made earlier with the level of talent supporting potentially another franchise or two, I think there's plenty of it out there. And I think from a fan's perspective, just watching the way the game's played with the ball movement, the player movement, uh, the shot making, it's it's really unprecedented not to take anything away from the history of the game, but it, it is in a good place. And I think, going forward um it will only continue to grow because it is so enjoyable from a fan's perspective uh where the game is and it finds itself right now chris and i'll start with you and then spencer you can chime in as well we you know, we talked and joked everybody jokes about the sticker shock when you go into the arena and it, it's just it's a new world man i mean this is this is what things cost 
go buy a drink at a hotel bar. You know, you know, it, it, it's not cheap anywhere. That being said, scooting that aside, your thoughts as you watched Climate Pledge Arena kind of come out of the ground. And then when, you know, that, that opening night, whether it was the Coldplay concert, whether it was the Foo Fighters, whether it was a crack and opening up their, their uh, uh, stay there. Just your, your thoughts on the building to this point when you walk around and walk through it after after watching this city kind of wrestle with this idea for so many years about what to do about a building. Yeah, that's a great question, Gas. Uh, I don't know if I've really had a chance to, to kind of soak it all in, the idea of walking around that building after so many years of, I mean, I've made the joke multiple times being the the beat reporter for a mythical building and two mythical teams. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I stood there on, on the first night at climate pledge, just trying to, to take it all in. Cause it's, it's really, it's not the same building. Uh, it's not the same entrance. You, you do see one of the columns that, that on the West side used to be an entrance that is uh, still it's in the building. It's in climate pledge now. So it, it's really uh, kind of odd to think about it. And, and then when you think back to, to 2008, just how dramatically different this city is uh, that the, all those empty parking lots, as you know, as you both know um, around the building have been converted into to mid rise towers. Uh, South Lake union has exploded. The population of Seattle is, is gone up by 25%. It's, it's a different city now than a, a decade ago. And, and I think there's a lot of people and it's good that you're doing this podcast that, that don't know uh, the history uh, that the, the Sonics have in this town and what they have meant to so many people. Um, that's a long way of saying, I, I just haven't had a, a chance to really, to think about, God, it actually happened uh, after, after all of these years. Yeah, so you, you could, you can talk about, you've been all the arenas and they can all kind of tend to look alike from a player perspective, but this one's, if you're from Seattle, especially this is a special building kind of by no design of my own got a chance to really give give myself a tour the first time I went in there because uh you know you walk in the main level and you get ready to go up to your seat and we started walking up and kind of got lost you know we didn't <laughs> we didn't have really the rundown that everything kind of goes down from there so <clears throat> I got a pretty good look at the, the whole thing but it is uh you know it's always it was always a special arena for basketball because it was built for basketball it you know it had the vertical uh the vertical sight lines, it was very steep. There wasn't really a bad seat in the house. And I think that's one of the trends that the NBA and the NHL specifically have gotten right within call it the last five to seven years of arena construction is they've gotten away from the 21, 22,000 seat staple centers, uh, right. you know, multi-purpose arenas like that and started trying to cater to, you know, all right, let's get it between 16 and 18. Uh, that's a much easier number to consistently fill out or fill out as close as possible. And given that footprint that they're working with at in key arena, climate pledge arena, sorry, it's, I'm still having trouble with it. Um, <laughs> it lent a great opportunity to create an arena where there really are no bad seats. I mean, I've been fortunate to go to a few cracking games, a couple concerts, a Seattle U game. Uh, I missed the battle in Seattle, but every, every vantage point that I've had in that arena uh, is friendly to the spectator, to the consumer. And I think specifically from the shots I saw uh, at the Battle of Seattle when they had all the stands down there and it, it really was uh, was packed in there, it, it looked like a whole world-class basketball arena. And just with all the amenities now that can support having uh, franchises at the highest level, be it the suites, the club seating, all the other uh, potential revenue pipelines that Key Arena just didn't have, uh, when it ultimately met its end. I will say, Gas, the acoustics in, in particular are, are different than the old Key Arena, the, the mm -hmm. lavendary baffles. When you look up and it, you're not looking at the old Key Arena Coliseum roof, I mean, those those panels uh, have really made a difference. And it's, I know on hockey games, and, and again, I've, I've been lucky enough to go to a, a few of them so far this year, it is rocking in there. I mean, they've nailed it on the acoustics, I think. I, I did a... a a show, a live show uh, at Seattle Center a couple of years ago now with the engineers, the acoustic engineers. This was before, I mean, maybe the girders were out of the ground and that was it. There was nothing built yet. And I'll say, and I think you guys both know this, that was a huge part of the construction. And Spencer, to your point again, people have learned how to get buildings right. It's look, if we're going to do 
50 or 100 concerts a year in this building. We don't want people walking out telling their friends, well, the show was okay, but the sound was terrible. You want people to be able to hear. Uh, and I have not been to a concert yet there. I've been to hockey. Uh, it, 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 all the reports you get from concerts is that the sound is, is terrific. And that's obvious. You know, again, that's important. You want the building to be healthy. You want the, the tenants in the building to be healthy. That's, that's all important to the long-term future of things. I, I agree with you, Spencer, too. The, the battle in Seattle, I didn't get to go, but on TV, that was another kind of tangible moment for me of like, wow, we've got a basketball arena now and it was hot and the game was great. And from your perspective, the Zags lost. I'm sure that didn't break your UW heart. Uh, just an exciting game and, a, and, and and it looked good and sounded good. And, uh, you know, I think it was Sean Farnham who made the, the comment about, uh, about getting the Sonics back. You know, again, there's there's a lot of heat for this as, as, as you look around and, and, and it did feel, didn't it? Watching that, like, okay, we get, we have basketball back now and no offense to Seattle you, it's just a different level when you're talking about Gonzaga and Alabama. Yeah. And, and it's every one of those opportunities that we have to promote, promote the building and promote the city uh, I think is valuable. And, and you see, you know, last week Clay was on Instagram live and he's talking about bring back our Sonics and then, the next three hours of my social media account is a bunch of people talking about that. And mm -hmm. so any momentum that we can parlay from getting that type of exposure, uh, you know, to the audience beyond our, uh, beyond our region, I think is important to just to send that message because there are still so many people in the, I mean, you guys know how the league works. It's, it's an old boys club and, you know, guys get done playing and they move to the front office or they move to coaching. And so there are still so many connections of guys that played here for the Sonics or played here as opponents or trainers that came coaches that came and coached everybody speaks so highly about their time coming to Seattle. And now that they're starting to get the conversation going again, you're starting to hear some of those voices, uh, you know, picking back up and promoting the idea of getting a franchise back here sooner rather than later. And, and without going down the, the well-worn path, I think a lot of people, the further away you've gotten from the emotion of this story, realize it was a pretty raw deal. And then it was, you know, again, we can talk about whose fault it was. That's been done. It was a bit of a raw deal. Chris, I, I still talk to fans who are still, you know, I'm angry. I'll never go to a game again. And I don't know, maybe they, they, there probably will be some people like that. Is that a thing to be concerned about? We, we've used the phrase plug and play a couple of times. Do you sense among the fans here, Spencer certainly does. And he's talking about they'll sell out the tickets and we're going to, we're going to come right back to it. Will there be any, pushback like opening night will be incredible and it'll be great but then 10 games in will there be any pushback of you know what i i, I just I, I can't forgive them for what they did i, I don't think so i i 100 agree with spencer and i think it's part of the it's part of the calculus right now with uh, when you bring a team to seattle whether it be expansion or otherwise is uh you do want the kraken to succeed you want them to get a good foothold in the market because I think when the Sonics do come back, it's not an exaggeration on Spencer's part. Those season ticket deposits are, it's going to break servers. Uh, that is going to be an event that is 15 plus years in the making, getting a team back to Seattle. Uh, I think people will then talk about that, that old story of the past in 2006, seven and eight, but, you know, think about all the brand new fans there are in Seattle mm -hmm. over the last decade uh, because of the growth the explosive growth in this region. I, I don't think that's a concern at all. I think people will, uh, th those, those open wounds that they have right now will heal pretty quickly uh, when, when the Sonics do return. Spencer, you mentioned somebody earlier on in the show and I, I want to talk about, cause I, I, I wrote a piece last year for our Teal's website about how, you know, one thing that would be really cool when the arena comes back and there are plenty of people you could look at, you've named a street after Lenny and that's great. I wrote a piece kind of speculating that, you know, it might be kind of cool for, for, for a client of pledge arena to do a statue out on the concourse and the statue, in my opinion, the per perfect person would be Sue Bird who has won four championships, four different coaches, I think three different ownership groups. I mean, the storm has just had a remarkable run of success and they are going to be in the building next spring. Uh, you know, you could talk Gary Payton, you could talk the 79. If you wanted to do a statue, you could talk a lot of people. I think Sue would be pretty cool. How, how do you view her in terms of an iconic Seattle sports personality and, and, and talk about how difficult it is to do what she's done to keep playing at a championship level for as long as she has with everything changing around her teammates, coaches, ownership groups. I mean, it's the longevity alone is to me, always one of the most impressive things about athletes, 
no matter how you stack up their stats or their careers or, or what have you, anybody that can can succeed in one place for that amount of time speaks volumes about not only their talent, but obviously their character and all the intangibles that come with it. And as a Queen Anne guy that, that grew up up here and, you know, bounced around and is settled back on the hill. I remember when I was a kid, when we got word that, that Sue moved to Queen Anne and she was whipping her Hummer around and you'd see her at Safeway. <laughs> and it was like, you know, she was like our celebrity that, that we could hang our hats on because she lived on Queen Anne. And, and we thought, uh, we thought that was the coolest thing in the world. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, uh, our little, Queen Anne Rec Center team, they, they recruited us to go down there for the kickoff announcement when the Storm uh, were first being, you know, getting into existence as an expansion franchise. And then, you know, she has been the consistent uh, face of the franchise from day one, 20, whatever years later to where, where they are now through all the success that they've had, which is, I mean, got to be pretty close to unrivaled in, in WNBA history. And um, everything she does on the court, more importantly, everything she's done off the court and for the community. And I know she still lives uh, up, you know, up here on Queen Anne uh, down in, in the same neighborhood as I do. And, and she's just been such a positive, consistent uh, role model uh, in our city, in our region, and such a great ambassador for basketball uh, in the city and beyond uh, that I think that would be a, a very appropriate, uh, you know, gesture of recognition for everything that she's, she's contributed. And she just sent us a note. She'd appreciate it if you'd stop following her around at the grocery store. She thought it was cute when you were a kid, but at this point it's just kind of creepy. So she'd like you to stop it. Who, Hey, who would win? You get a bet on yourself. I hope it's a shooting contest between you and her, not one-on-one, -on -one, just you guys out there shooting. You're, oh, man, you're a pretty like good to, shooter. I'd like to see it. I'd, that'd be a good one. I, I would like to think I could take it, but uh, you know, maybe we could draw that up. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, you, your view of, of the storm and, and because, again, we can get caught up with with the Sonics coming back and, and, and the show is called Iconic Sonics, obviously. But the storm has been there. And again, what they've done the last few years, they haven't had a home. They've been like a homeless basketball team. And they just you know, they didn't win it this year, but they won it last year. Uh, they are not to be discounted when you talk about keeping this arena healthy and moving forward. They'll have a huge fan base and their fans have been incredibly loyal given what they've been asked to do the last couple of years. Yeah. And I'm curious how they'll, they'll configure the arena. We know what they, they did with uh, key arena when the storm played there. It, will they have a different configuration for the storm? Will the interest be higher, even higher in the storm uh, when they do play in, in climate pledge and perhaps that, that will rely on whether Sue comes back. I, I would tell you this uh, to go back to Sue that uh, in the, in the pregame ceremony at the Kraken games. Now they're, they're playing as I think you both know this, this video to get fans fired up and George Carl is part of it. X-Man's part of it. Cliff Averill, the Seahawks uh, part of it. And, and the person who is also a part of it that gets the biggest cheers mm -hmm. every game is Sue Bird. Uh, and, and I think it speaks to just, the appreciation of her still in this community. I told you earlier, I put her and, and Lenny Wilkins kind of in the same breath in terms of their status and their lore here in the city of Seattle. Uh, I think uh, it, it would be interesting to see uh, just if the interest in the storm is higher because of this brand new arena uh, in this first season that they uh, play there. One last thing on the statue, Spencer, I, I, I haven't designed a lot of statues in my life, but shouldn't it have a, a, a nose bandage for, I mean, because she's had her nose broken so many times by this point, people might not recognize a statue of her without a nose bandage on it. No, they, they would know who it is. I don't think that'd be an issue. <laughs> As we wrap it up, guys, um, Spencer, you touched on a little bit when we first started and, and I want to, you know, one of the things I always liked about you, you've always been an outspoken and a thoughtful guy and, and you've been willing to say stuff that's on your mind. What would it, what would it mean to you? And do you think the other guys, Jamal Crawford, Jason Terry, on and on, I'll, I'll forget a bunch of guys, but all these guys from this city who went on to great careers in the NBA to, to, to have their, their, their home course back, if you will, to be able to, if they're in Seattle, to just drive downtown to see a game, you know, 13 years now, maybe a couple more before it finally happens. But what, what would it mean to you to get the league back here in your hometown? I, I mean, it's, I still struggle putting it into words. Just, just thinking about it. I get goosebumps uh, because it, it was such a big part of my life before basketball was even my career. Uh, it was such a big part of my childhood. Uh, the thing that I think about 
not to get too far off topic, you know, I have little cousins and, and, you know, my friends have kids now that have to drive to Portland to take them to see an NBA game, or they have to plan a vacation to go down to LA so they can watch their favorite players. And there's this generation of kids now that are in high school that never grew up being able to go to a game with their team or go to a game with their parents that have missed out on what for me was such a formative uh, part of my childhood basketball development combination of the two. And even sitting here as a 33 year old, the thought of the Sonics coming back almost transforms me to be in that 12 year old that would go down to the games with my dad and, and get a cheeseburger at Dick's beforehand at, on a Tuesday night, stay up past my bedtime. I mean, that was some of the most fun I had uh, as a kid growing up in Seattle and, and the thought a of, of all the kids that missed out on that breaks my heart, but more importantly, um, thinking about when it finally does get righted, that we're going to have the opportunity to not have to go through that with the next generation of kids and, and that we're going to be able to do that going forward. Uh, it, it would put a smile on my face that I don't know that a lot of, uh, a lot of other things could at this point. Chris, you've, you've covered sports and news and politics and culture in this town for a long, long time. Um, you know, one of the more unfortunate statements uh, uh, back in the day about pro basketball was made by a city council person named Nick Licata, who said, well, it doesn't offer a lot of cultural relevance. It was one of the most heinous statements I've ever heard anybody say. And you can really go a long way down how bad that phrase was. Um, culturally speaking in this town, and out on the street and talking to people, what would the return of, of, of a beloved local institution, what would that mean, do you think, to the city? I, I think it would be huge. And it's, it's one of the reasons why uh, this soon-to-be mayor and the, and the outgoing mayor uh, have both put this at the, uh, the top of their priority charts in terms of, of getting the Sonics back. I, I think you look at the NBA uh, and, and the diversity of the fan base. That's one of the things I always loved about it when it was uh, in Seattle versus other sports and, and the way that, that sports can bring people together under one roof. And it, you just look around the city of Seattle and you can still see uh, in places uh, like off the Burke Gilman Trail, a, a court that's got a faded Sonic sign. And uh, down yeah. in South Seattle, you can see uh, an old uh, Gary Payton mural. And, and you can look around town and you can see that, that there is interest throughout the city about this basketball team called the Sonics. And I, I just think it would be so great to get everybody back under the roof together celebrating something like this because it is it's more than just basketball it, it, it has it was it was a cultural uh, a gathering for people in the city of Seattle and, and it brought people together like uh, I don't think a lot of these sports do and we're all optimistic that again it's sooner rather than later in terms of return right I'm not put words in anybody's mouth but it sure feels like everything's moving in the right direction the um the show is called Iconic Sonics. I want to point out an iconic image uh, in each of our guests. Uh, uh, is, is that a McDonald's All-American basketball behind you there, Spencer? Is that what I yeah, see? Yeah, that's that's one uh, we got, and I got the John Wooden signature on there when uh, you know he was wow. still kind of the master of ceremony. So that's one of that's one of my most uh, prized possessions there. And it should be. And and Chris, of course, has a giant space needle in his <laughs> living room because he's just hooked on Seattle. But, but I will humbly offer up mine as, as, as a, an icon worthy of either of those two, uh, just right behind and up above me. I'm not talking about the Keith Richards bobblehead, which is pretty damn cool, if I do say so myself. But one shelf above, that's a Kevin Calabro bobblehead. And I'll put that with a McDonald's All-Star Ball and the Space Needle as, as a, an unbeatable trio of icons in this city. Uh, guys, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I, the, the tone of this conversation makes me feel good. And you know, we're, we're, you, know, you mentioned that these shows are important because we want to keep the history and the excitement alive. Uh, and it's, uh, and, and it's, I think, coming to a good fruition eventually. Fellas, thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us.